The conflict in Ukraine is only one of the wars Vladimir Putin is fighting. At home, he's cracked down viciously on dissent and opposition. Putin's chief target in Russia has been this man, Alexei Navalny, now in jail with his anti-corruption foundation banned and labelled extremist. They're calling on Russians to do whatever they can to stop the war in Ukraine. But what about the dangers in taking on the state? My guest this week in exile in London is one of Navalny's associates, Vladimir Ashokov. Organized a position in Russia that can participate in elections, that can um, launch campaigns, they can, that can do organized mass protests. It's really not possible at this point. For now, the group is naming and shaming thousands of officials who are supporting the war in Ukraine. But how far will that dent Putin's power? And why, despite so many common goals, are Russian opposition groups still fighting amongst themselves? Vladimir Ashokov, welcome to Conflict Zone. Uh, it's great to be with you. At the beginning of this month, associates of Alexei Navalny called for what they put it as a partisan underground in Russia to resist the war in Ukraine. Your organization is banned, it's labeled extremists. So anybody who answers your call is taking quite a risk, aren't they? Let us put it into context. Throughout its history, Anti-Corruption Foundation and Alexei Navalny team have been operating in Russia. At the peak of our activities, we had a regional network of branches in over 40 cities. We had uh, about 200 people working for us in Moscow. In spring of last year, our organization has been deemed extremist, and we had to relocate all the key people outside of Russia. Um, now, when the Russia started its uh, brutal aggression against uh, Ukraine in February, even more restrictive measures were put in place. At the same time, we are constantly monitoring what goes on uh, in Russia, in different regions. And uh, over the last few months, we have been feeling that the discontent is growing. And our goal is to use our connection, our networks, the people who used to work with us, our volunteers, to try to supplement this discontent and provide some organizational structure. Yes, but um, as you say, the, uh, as you say, times have changed. Um, penalties have changed. Your organization is no longer legal. It's on a par with Islamic State. It's been declared, uh, you know, it's been declared extremist. You're asking people to spread information, provide legal assistance, but also, and this is the most risky part, sabotage the work of military enlistment centers. And the danger of getting caught doing that is what? Uh, there is danger in Russia now just for going out to the street with a blank piece of paper because the authorities assume you're protesting against the war. At the same time, we encourage all Russian people inside Russia, outside of Russia, to do their part to stop this war and to bring down this autocrative uh, regime of Vladimir Putin. Everybody chooses what they do according to their own abilities, according to their own beliefs and appetite for risk. But to confront this regime um, is, I think, a duty of any reasonable person. And uh, we want to put the tools into the hands of people who believe that they can do more and who can um, do little bits and pieces. Um, spread out leaflets, um, in some cases, sabotage, et cetera, et cetera. It's all... Sabotage isn't bits activity. and pieces, is it? Sabotage isn't bits and pieces. Sabotage is a pretty serious thing to get engaged in. Yes, but, but it is our goal to bring down this regime, and sabotage is one of the nonviolent instruments to do that. How is it so nonviolent sabotage? How is it nonviolent? People have been uh, blowing up enlistment centers, haven't they? 
blowing up uh i, I i've never I, I think you're mistaken there has never been a blow up of an enlistment center or a fire have been, started there have been fire starting fire to an enlistment center that that uh enlists people to fight in this unfair and brutal war is uh i think is very commendable we definitely support this activity um, and uh, that's what we're doing. We created a system that uh, allows people to rename anonymous. So we try as much as possible to limit the risk of um, this network to be discovered by authorities. But ultimately, uh, the person decides himself or herself what is the level of risk that they can tolerate in fighting this uh, brutal regime. Your organization has been clear that the Russian people aren't simply going to overthrow Putin. It's just not going to happen. So, so in the grand scheme of things, the kind of resistance you're asking for, can that justify the risks you're asking people to take? I think the change in Russia will come from a combination of dissatisfaction in the political and business elite of Russia and the wide discontent in the population. And both of these groups of people uh, were having a quite a hard time since the war started. People at the top have seen their fortunes decimated, their lifestyles when they can vacation in Western Europe, when their children go to British private schools, when their yachts are moored in Italy has been shattered. And for an average person, um, they have seen inflation, they have seen familiar foreign brands leaving Russia, and now they see a constant stream of coffins coming back from Ukraine. And for what? Um, the military operation has not been going very successfully for Russian army. So these uh, processes take time. but at at some point, they will reinforce each other. And that's, I think, the only plausible scenario for change. You talk about people seeing coffins returning from the war. People are also seeing hundreds put in jail, many facing 15-year sentences for resisting in the most trivial ways. Maybe they once gave money to an organization like yours that's now banned. Police informers are everywhere. Who knows how many may have penetrated your organizations. Um, what's been the response to your call for this partisan underground? We are basing our efforts on uh, more than a decade of work uh, in Russia in different regions. Um, before the war started, we had over 10 million subscribers to different um, different uh, social networks that were broadcasting our message. We had an email distribution list of over a million people. So we are not starting from scratch. And uh, obviously we, for, for um understandable reasons we don't disclose the response and we don't disclose the scale of these activities but uh we are quite optimistic the response has been dozens of uh, thousands of uh, people who would like to participate in this network Mr. Ashokov, one of your most ambitious ventures has been to compile a list of 6,000 Russians said to be bribe takers, warmongers, corrupt officials, propagandists, people you accuse of enabling the invasion of Ukraine. Are you not concerned that this is the equivalent of sort of painting a target on their back and encouraging people to shoot at them? Indeed, uh, there have been a uh many people who are the pillars of this regime people who are involved in war propaganda people uh who are officials in various levels of russian government 
businessmen connected to Putin's regime, his cronies. And um, the for years, our team has been advocating uh, sanctions, personal sanctions against uh, perpetrators of human rights abusers, against people involved in corruption. But our calls have been falling on deaf ears. It has been a trickle in terms of sanctions, even after the Russia, Russian annexation of Crimea and meddling in eastern Ukraine. Now, after the war, we've seen an avalanche of sanctions. And uh, it was important for us to um, make suggestions to Western governments to make their sanctions policy more nuanced. Um, and we came up with uh, this uh, list that uh, we uh, advocate and, and we lobby, whereas Western governments, that these people are included. They are people who have uh, contributed to the start of the war and who are now continuing to support the war. That's um, that's that has been the sort of the premise of our project, and uh, uh, it has received quite quite um, quite good support from the governments in the EU, in the US, and the UK. Um, just recently, uh, there was a resolution passed in. Uh, U.S. House of Representatives calling for the executive branch to review the 200 most um, most visible, the, the top priority 200 people from our list in terms of sanctioning them in the U.S. So I think it's working. Um, one important aspect I want of to ask our you, list is... Yes, just, sure. just briefly, just briefly. Um, by September, five months after you went public, there are only some 50 people on the list who had contacted you and asked to be taken off it. Are, are you surprised that the vast majority seemed completely untroubled by your accusations and just ignored the shaming? Um, the actual number is uh, over 100. Um, out of 6,000. It's mostly out of 6,000. Out, out of, out of, out of 6, it's it's not many, is it? It's not many. To me, anything that's above zero, if a person changes uh, his or her mind in terms of support of the war, in terms of being part of the government structures, being on the board of Russian state-owned companies, that's already a lot, because without our list, this number would be zero. So um, it has been over 100. We are constantly reviewing uh, this list. Every two weeks, there are some updates. We take uh, people out if there are reasons to believe that they don't, uh, that, that, that they no longer qualify for being on the list. We make additions. Um, and specifically, the, the nature of our list is that we want to use it not as much as an instrument of punishment, but an, as an instrument of coercion, so that less people uh, support the war and contribute to it. So, for instance, if we take Western sanctions, it has been a one-way ticket. A person, an official or a businessman is sanctioned, and there's nothing they can do um, that can remove them from this list. With us, it's different. If you're on the board of a state company, uh, if you resign or if you're in the top management of a state company agency or organization, resign, send us proof of that, and um, we'll review it and uh, we'll take you out. So, okay, um, all right. Our, to, our list is live. To date, you're the best known opposition group in Russia and you've had some remarkable successes. You lifted the lid on a huge amount of corruption. You've shown films, Putin's palace, for instance. You've named names and reported on wide-ranging corruption. 12 million views a month on YouTube, something like that. But what sign is there that 
any of that has materially affected Putin's support in the country. Navalny has said Putin is afraid of the truth. But Putin simply, simply shrugs off your truth as fake news. What's he got to be afraid of? It's not easy to fight an oppressive regime like Putin's. We have been doing it for a number of years. There are some objective benchmarks how you can judge a success of political movement. I think the most objective result was the results of elections of uh, Moscow mayor in 2013 when Alexei Navalny was able to participate. That's, that's a, sort of an objective measure, the results of an election. So he got 28% of votes uh, as opposed to 51 for the incumbent mayor. So, and that was despite all the administrative obstacles that we had, despite Navalny being a sort of a newcomer, uh, despite the incumbent mayor having all the sources, all the resources that the power um, was able to give him. This so, was nine years ago, Mr. Ashokov. I'm, to, I'm talking about now. Everything has changed since then. Everything has changed. What has Putin got to be afraid of now? Navalny's in jail and your organization is banned and labeled extremist. What's he got to be afraid of? As I said, it will be the wide discontent in uh, population and uh, the disillusionment uh, with the regime in the elite. If you, even if you talk about close circle of Putin, they are really not happy with the state of affairs. Uh, they're afraid of Putin and of his security apparatus, but they, of course, would like to go back to how things were, and they were able to enjoy their wealth. They were integrated uh, in the West. Um, and uh, they were able to enjoy the lifestyle uh, that they were used to. Now it's all broken. Um, and that's what Putin needs to be afraid. There's a big uh, factor, of course, what happens on the battlefields of Ukraine. All right, I want and... to come to that. I want to come to that a little later, but I want to talk also about the opposition movement in general in Russia. And plenty of people have talked about the disunity that seems to attend these groups. Why hasn't your organization put more effort into improving relations with other opposition groups? After all, you share quite a few goals, don't you, with each other? Indeed, we have been working with various democratic political forces for years. Uh, we created the Coordination uh, Council in 2012. We participated in a number of elections uh, together with uh, different other democratic forces. But that um, didn't always work out, did it? I mean, it ended up, you ended up squabbling with other groups. Um, I remember in uh, 2021, when was the last election? 2021, um, the opposition, uh, the opposition member Anastasia Bruchyanova, she said the opposition can't be united. A liberal can't agree with a nationalist or a communist. It's simply impossible. It's a big drawback, this kind of disunity, isn't it? Not really. The people who make real effort at um, uh, trying to do something useful and not just talk, they achieve successes. We're in contact with various opposition groups. But the thing that made Navalny and our organization um, successful, and we increase our recognition, and we are able to um, create the regional networks, and we are able now to keep dozens of people in our office outside of Russia, is that we focus just on a few things. We do investigations, we do media work. Our YouTube channels are probably the most popular current news um, sources uh, in Russia. 
Um, and now we're restoring this work in Russia through our regional network. Um, and um, we have a certain hierarchy. We have about 70 people, mostly in Vilnius, in a few other um, European cities as well, who work full time on this. And for us to um, join forces with somebody, there has to be a goal. The, the other parties need to bring something to the table. It's not enough just to be a, a blogger uh, with uh, 50,000 followers to be able to join forces with us and to have equal voices in what we do. Mr. Ashokov, do you ever foresee a time when Navalny or your group could possibly emerge again as a serious political contender on Russia's national stage? I ask because Vladimir Milov, a former minister, and economic advisor to Navalny, he said last week that Russia's organized opposition is destroyed. There is no mechanism, he said, for public discontent to translate into political change. Can you honestly tell me he's wrong? Well, I think... It, he's, one he of your, right. he's one of your closest advisors. Absolutely. But you always need to put words in the context. Indeed, uh, if you protest openly against the war and against Putin's brutality in Russia, you will be fined, you will be detained, and ultimately you will be jailed. That's the situation. So in this sense, organized opposition in Russia that can participate in elections, that can um, launch campaigns, they can, that can do organized mass protests, it's really not possible at this point. But the millions of people who supported us, who supported other democratic forces, many of whom who had to move out of Russia, they didn't go anywhere. And uh, once the political situation in Russia changed, a gradual liberalization uh, and end of hostilities with Ukraine and start of some sort of uh, communication with the West in a constructive way. Once that starts, um, and I believe that it will start within the next five years, maybe even earlier, I think there will be a opening for us and for other democratic forces to enter the Russian politics properly. If, to... if the war is as long and bitter as some people fear, what do you think that will do to Russia? You said you think there might be an end to hostilities over the next five years. Um, do you see any sign of deep and abiding changes taking place in the country as a result of this war? Different people believe in different things. In terms of war, uh, from where we see it today, it's difficult to envision that the war will end in the next few months. I think it's something like a year. In a year, uh, I think is, is a reasonable prediction that the hostilities uh, will stop. Why? Based the, on what? what? What makes you say that? I think within a year, it's reasonable to expect that Ukrainian army will um, make a few more significant advances on the battlefield. We see that the Russian military capabilities are deteriorating, while Ukraine's uh, capability and the flow of arms and coordination is improving. Um, they are already bold enough to launch attacks in the sort of in, in the jewel of Russian Navy in Sevastopol uh, naval base in Crimea. And so you think, I think Russia military, is just going to give up in the end and go home? Military. That's not what I said. Um, I'm saying that the military capabilities 
the balance of power is shifting to Ukraine, and we will see that manifesting itself on the battlefield. The economic sanctions placed on Russia will be taking their gradual toll. Um, the And, of course, the losses from the Ukrainian front are taking... Um, are affecting the um, the mood of Russian public. Um, so I think in a year, these processes would lead to possibly, and again, we're all speaking in probabilities and possibilities here, to Russia's inability to continue the war. All right. That's my prediction. Vadim Ashokov, it's been good to have you on the program. Thank you very much indeed for being on Conflict Zone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. Thank you.